We're looking for a brain. Not just any brain. Well, yes, it can be any brain from anywhere in the world. But it must be a brain that has an idea. Not just any idea. A cutting-edge idea. A mind-boggling idea. A brilliant idea. The result of untamable curiosity and meticulous research. Ready to grow and break new ground in Europe with our generous funding. Got a brain like that? The ERC. Supporting top researchers from anywhere, anywhere in the world. In the world. Get in touch, get in touch. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this session at the EU Research and Innovation Days in conversation with the European Research Council Scientific Council. Um, one of the fantastic things and uh, very unusual things about the ERC is that we have this uh, scientific council composed of 22 uh, independent scientists and researchers, very eminent personalities uh, from uh, across Europe and beyond. Uh, and we'll be joined uh, this afternoon by the uh, interim president of the ERC, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, and our vice president, uh, one of our three vice presidents, uh, Evelyn Krohn. Uh, so, um, this is your opportunity to ask all of those questions that you'd already always wanted to ask to the ERC Scientific Council. Um, we'll be uh, starting with some polls using Slido, and I think you should see on the screen soon the uh, hashtag that you can use. Um, so, you can either use the QR code or the hashtag uh, logging in at, um, at slido.com in your browser or using the smartphone app. Uh, and you can use that smart uh, that uh, QR, QR code or the hashtag to um, access the questions we'll be using as kind of icebreakers uh, for this session. Um, because we have uh, just over, I see, 150 people who've already joined us, then our numbers are climbing. Um, and we'd like to know a little bit who we have with us in the session. Obviously, we can't unfortunately see you or hear from you directly, uh, but we will be using those Slido questions in a moment to uh, try to find out who's joined us for the session uh, this afternoon. Uh, then we'll be hearing presentations from our two speakers. Um, so, as I mentioned, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon and Evelyn Cohn. Um, and those presentations will be followed by uh, Q&A. So the method we're going to be using for that is the chat uh, that you'll see, the chat function here um, in WebEx, which we're using for this session. Uh, so you can post your questions in the chat and then we will be handling those and I'll be um, handing over to the, the two speakers so that they can try to address as many of your questions as possible uh, during the 45 minutes that we have uh, for this session. So I think without further ado, let's uh, move on to the icebreaker questions. Uh, so perhaps I could ask my colleagues to um, open the first question and we can uh, see a little bit who we have uh, with us in the session this afternoon. So um, uh, we'd be interested to hear a little bit about the profile of the participants we have in, in this session. Uh, so um, uh, are you a researcher, a policy officer? Uh, one of our national contact points, uh, very important multipliers and relays for us in the member states, or a member of the general public, a European citizen interested in uh, science and research issues. So we can see uh, the voting going on live. Uh, we have just over 200 participants now in the session, so let's let this run a little bit longer while people hopefully connect to Slido. Uh, so we have a, a large miscellaneous um, category, uh, so uh, people not falling into any of the, the other categories, which is interesting. Okay, well it looks like none of the above is the winner of that poll, um, but next down is policy officers, presumably either from the European uh, institutions or national research uh, bodies and researchers. Um, maybe some of you are interested in applying for uh, ERC grants, so you'll be hearing a bit about that during the session. Good to see that some of our colleagues from the National Contact Points are with us as well this afternoon. And we have uh, some members of the general public as well. 
Okay, perhaps let's move on to the, the second of our four icebreaker questions. So uh, we'd be interested to hear where you're joining us from uh, this afternoon. We've all become very used to, for better or for worse, during the last year and a half to these remote meetings. One of the great things is that we're able to connect uh, from anywhere in the world uh, without traveling. Um, and it seems we have a, a very uh, a significant majority of Europeans with us. I see people joining from North America or Oceania. And I see that we're now up to 233 participants in the session. So if you joined us a bit late, you can find the uh, QR code uh, or the event hashtag to log into Slido just to share with us your answers to, to these few questions. Uh, so anyway, very conclusive result for question two, 94% of participants this afternoon from, uh, from Europe. Okay, let's move on to the third question. Uh, so then I think this is probably useful for our speakers as well to know how familiar uh, participants in our session are with the ERC, uh, how well they know our, our unique governance with our scientific council, our different grant schemes, uh, our evaluation system, which we're very proud of with our evaluation panels uh, covering the different scientific domains. And it looks like we already have quite a, a well-informed audience with us this afternoon with 43, 42% uh, of participants saying they're already very familiar with the ERC, uh, some slightly familiar, moderately familiar, but only 11% who, who are not familiar at all with the ERC. So I think we can assume uh, that people at least have a basic knowledge or if not uh, a very good knowledge already of the ERC. So we can get, uh, get down to business and uh, discuss some of the details that I'm sure you're interested in. Okay, let's have the, the fourth and final question using Slido. And this is a free text question. We're going to be showing a word cloud when you've had a chance to respond to this. So um, what comes to mind when you think of the ERC? And I think it, it's good if you just put in a single uh, answer to that question. So we get a, a nice visual impression of people's perceptions of the ERC. And we can definitely see excellence as a large block in there in the center. Groundbreaking research, funding, of course, with the ERC being a significant portion of the EU's research innovation program, Horizon Europe. Excellent science, competitive. Yes, I, I know that uh, our president, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, will be talking about um, uh, the results of our funding calls which are indeed competitive, there's competition for funding. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, very useful because it gives us an impression of uh, what, what audience we have this afternoon, perhaps uh, your expectations for, um, uh, for this session. So I think we can take away the, um, the Slido uh, screen and uh, I will now introduce our first speaker this afternoon, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, uh, who is currently president ad interim of the European Research Council. Um, he uh, came back in uh, July of last year. Um, and of course, as many of you will no doubt know, he was uh, ERC president from uh, 2014 until 2019, January 2014 until December 2019. Uh, before that, uh, Professor Bourguignon was the director of the Institut des Autres Etudes Scientifiques uh, in France from 1994 to 2013. Uh, he's a mathematician by training. Uh, he had a long and distinguished ca career at the CNRS in France, uh, and he also held professor positions at the École Polytechnique, uh, and he was pre president of the Société Mathématique de France and president of the European Mathematical Society from 1995 to 1998. Uh, so, uh, Jean-Pierre, um, the ERC recently celebrated its 10,000th uh, grantee, which was an important milestone. You've been at the helm of the ERC uh, for, for um, uh, a good part of the last period of its history. Um, perhaps you could begin by sharing with us uh, some information and, and your thoughts about the ERC's achievements uh, to date. 
Thank you very much, Tony, for giving me uh, the opportunity indeed to present the ERC for people who have not yet uh, heard about it, uh, but also to people who, who think they know about it. So let's try and see whether we can surprise them a little bit. So I think um, the very important uh, point uh, about um, the ERC, uh, I need to know how whether I, I can move that. Yes, very good. So was that really the motivation of scientists when they fought to get the ERC created um, uh, as a funding program at the European level was really uh, the, the fact that for quite a while, uh, research was not a shared responsibility of uh, the European Commission. And as a result, uh, it was not possible to fund individual researchers. But at the same time, uh, we could see that uh, EU was uh, not uh, we producing a lot of new new uh, knowledge, but uh, still in terms of uh, leading knowledge, high impact science, uh, US was really leading. And the new feature in the 21st century is really the moving forward of a number of countries, in particular China. So I think it was really definitely uh, one of the rationale for the creation of the ERC was to reinforce excellence, to try to take, uh, uh, to improve the position of, uh, of ERC in, of uh, Europe, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in this race. Uh, and uh, in particular uh, in uh, areas where definitely the um, uh, new, new areas coming up and um, of course, the whole thing uh, happens in a very normal situation for scientists to be in competition, uh, although competition uh, means also cooperation at the same time. Uh, also, the uh, key element for ERC was really to make sure we could uh, either retain or attract to Europe some of the best scientists worldwide. And of course, uh, because uh, we hoped, and I think this is what happened, ERC has been successful then uh, it was, uh, we thought, a great encouragement to governments to really improve the investment. So the typical document which really created the ERC was this uh, report in 2005, and finally in 2007, the ERC could exist. So this is where we are. And uh, so now, uh, what is the ERC proper? It is indeed a, a funding program uh, by the European, a part of the framework program to support research innovation at European level. So it is really completely bottom up, as we say. So the scientists submit to us their most ambitious project. We uh, mostly uh, support individual researchers, which means they come to us with a, a way they would like to uh, attack a new problem and also describe with whom they want to work, but that's at their initiative, and it's uh, fully pan-European. One of the originality is indeed that the governance of the whole system has been given to the Scientific Council, 22 scientists, and uh, under the chairmanship of the president, with uh, the support of an extremely efficient agency, the executive agency in charge of ERC, and also for us, which is really the DNA of ERC, that scientific quality is the only criterion for selection. And so, as I said, we also are using global peer review. We rely a lot on our evaluators coming from all around the world. 15% of them are not based in Europe. That's very important. And we are completely holistic in terms of domains that we support. So all kinds of sciences and including social sciences and humanities. So this is uh, where we are. So the basic schemes to support researchers, one, uh, something which has now almost become uh, uh, a reference worldwide is the uh, decision by the Scientific Council to segment the scientific community for support in, uh, in terms of the distance to the scientists, the researchers, to their PhD. So we have the starting grants for uh, people holding a PhD between two and seven years, the consolidator grants uh, between seven and 12 years, and advanced grants for people who are already more in the in career. And in a sense, the, the, these competitions are very similar to one another, except we just get people with a similar level of advancement of their careers to compete between themselves. Of course, we, we did something else. We also, uh, the green part that you see, proof of concept, is um, a, a, a smaller program which has been introduced by the Scientific Council to help and accompany researchers who feel they want to get closer to the market 
or to societal needs. So we bring them with some amount of money to develop these, these ideas. But also the Scientific Council felt that uh, it, it really wanted to create a space which would be obviously uh, open to pluridisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, as you want to call it. Actually, many of our grants, uh, individual grants, are also pluridisciplinary, but the synergy grants that we created, that we relaunched in 2018, are really designed for uh, really welcoming uh, interdisciplinary projects. So it means that it's not just one person who proposes uh, the project, but two, three or four. So there are still small groups with for the truly ambitious project. I didn't say, but I should have said that the main grants for ERC are for five years, a long time, and Synergy are even for longer terms, because of course uh, the, the biggest, the, the bigger group, uh, so six years. The next thing I want to say, which is really the achievements, uh, more than 10,000 researchers have been funded by ERC, which means that the people working in their teams are almost 80,000 actually today. Number of publications is huge, but even more important than the number of publications is the quality of the publications, which is really outstanding and uh, really which uh, results in uh, international comparison, making the ERC the, the funding program with the highest um, percentage of uh, re results or articles, which are among the 1% most cited papers in the world. And the number of institutions who benefited from hosting a, a researcher uh, with an ERC grant is more than 800 today. The amount of money which was uh, spent by ERC since, since its creation is over 20 billion. And uh, the, the nationalities of the people who got grants is 85, uh, which is a very much larger number than Europe, which shows that we have been able either to retain or to attract to Europe also non-European scientists. So this is uh, the level of achievement. One feature which is very, very critical, and actually it's the consequence of this segmentation I mentioned, is that two of our main funding schemes are really uh, for researchers who are typically below 40 years of age. So there is some kind of priority to young scientists. Two thirds of our grants are really going to scientists who are below 40 years of age. And uh, this is also true of the people working in the teams uh, of course, choose, chosen by the by the researchers, the uh, grantee, as we call them. And then, uh, very important for the scientific council was really to so that was a decision, scientific council, to really evaluate the the uh, the average quality of the results done by um, by ERC uh, grantees, and this we did do it uh, through a system of choosing randomly, uh, typically two hundred fifty projects which are completed, that is two years after the end of the project, to have uh, external uh, people to check what they think of what has been achieved. The point is not to grade this project, is to get a global feeling of the quality of the program. And uh, the results are quite uh, satisfactory, and uh, I'm tending to use an understatement here that uh, about, uh, in average, 20% of the projects are considered as breakthroughs, uh, about 50 to 60% are considered major scientific advances, and then the ones are less successful. And even since we are pushing the projects to be high risk, high gain, we may think that uh, we have too many, we really miss the target. But of course, since the, pro the projects are five years long, you have time to readjust uh, and, and therefore to avoid being in the, in the uh, violet uh, situation, but more in the green one. And the next thing which I want to say, which is a, a big effort we made uh, when the ERC started, really the funding of, uh, there was quite a difference in the funding given to men and women. Uh, we know that in many areas of science, uh, we are not yet at the parity situation, but the ERC has been really very carefully looking into this without changing a word about uh, the priority given to scientific quality. So if you look at the period 2007, 2013, you can see that there's a real difference in the success rates of men and women. And we are very, very pleased that uh, in the later period, which corresponds to the program Horizon 2020, we just, uh, it's just the opposite now. Women are slightly leading over men in terms of success rates. So I think uh, we are very proud at the level of Scientific Council that all the measures which have been taken, which some also uh, result from the very hard work of the staff 
of the um, of the agency uh, managing the ERC that uh, we are now in a much sounder situation. Uh, and of course, uh, we we need to continue to monitor this very very closely to be sure that we are not uh, really getting away from this success. I've been uh, using some data which are listed there. So in, if uh, the data are available, people can check all these uh, references where really uh, you can uh, really see that uh, everything I said was documented. At ERC, we have a passion for um, uh, science-based uh, facts. So that's the way we want to work. So thank you very much. And uh, this is, um, if you want to know more about the ERC, the website contains a huge amount of information. Uh, there are in each country national contact points, and also you can also sign for the alerts. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, of course, I'm uh, welcoming all kinds of questions later on. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for that uh, quick summary. You could have said a lot more, obviously, after 14 years of experience of the ERC, but uh, that was a great overview of the ERC's grant schemes, so some of the achievements to date, and some of the diversity of our grantees in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of geographical diversity. Um, so please uh, do go ahead and post your questions in the chat, and we'll be coming to those soon. But then uh, before we do that, let me introduce our second speaker in this session this afternoon. Um, it's Professor Evelyn Kroon, who's uh, based at the uh, University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Professor Kroon, uh, Evelyn, is, um, uh, her specialist area is the way that uh, children and adolescents take decisions and how that affects their brain development. It's a really fascinating area of research and Evelyn has uh, written a, a great book called The Adolescent Brain that's also tried to explain uh, some of these scientific developments to the general public. Um, but Evelyn has been a member of our scientific council since 2017 and at the beginning of last year she became vice president uh, responsible for the social sciences and humanities domain. Uh, Evelyn, thanks very much for being uh, with us here this afternoon. It's great to have you. Thank you, Tony. Um, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. Um, so, first of all, thank you to uh, Jean-Pierre for, for setting out uh, the many uh, achievements uh, of the ERC. And uh, thank you all for listening uh, to this session. So, as you heard, we are still a relatively uh, new organization. But I think Jean-Pierre has shown that we have come uh, a long way uh, in a short time. And I believe there's still uh, much more to come from the ERC. So my first reason for optimism is the design of the ERC. Uh, the ERC is steered by an independent uh, scientific council, and we are in charge of the overall scientific strategy, and we have full authority over the decisions on the type of research uh, to be funded. And this helps to guarantee the quality of ERC's operation and peer review process uh, and the ERC's uh, credibility in the scientific community. This is very important to us. Uh, the Scientific Council has been uh, set up from scratch uh, by a, a now, and we now have a highly respected peer review system. We have created 27 panels covering all of the science and the humanities. And we are able to adapt the program flexibly as the need arises. Uh, we have devised and put in place five specific grant schemes, as was just explained by uh, Jean-Pierre Bourgagnon. And uh, we have tested various uh, approaches to supporting interdisciplinarity. Uh, we have introduced mass measures to uh, manage demand. And we have also consistently taken the lead on key issues affecting European science, such as open science, gender balance, and widening participation to the ERC's goals. And our independence should not be seen in any way as a threat or an annoyance to the rest of the framework program. Indeed, in the past, the ERC was seen as a laboratory for the rest of the framework program. The simple funding scheme, uh, which the Scientific Council introduced for the ERC grants in FP7, was subsequently taken up for all of the other grants in Horizon 2020. Uh, the European scientific community, which first campaigned for a simple science-driven funding mechanism at the EU level, has been consistent and a vocal supporter of the ERC and remains so. So we are very grateful for that. Now, achieving all of this could by, by no means be taken uh, for granted. 
When the ERC was created in 2007, it entered a relatively complex research funding landscape. Uh, there were already many institutions which support research at the international, European, national and regional levels. However, already in 2009, an independent review of the European Research Council's structure and mechanisms found that, and I quote, overall that the ERC has succeeded beyond expectations in attracting outstanding scientists across Europe and abroad to serve on its panels and received thousands of applica applications which were all reviewed despite the difficulties inherent in setting up such a complex endeavor in such a short time, end of quote. Um, we all benefit from the wonderful commitment of the staff and the management of the executive agency which implements our goals. We could not do this uh, without them. They have made it possible to deliver the quality service required. Now, my second reason for optimism is the bottom-up nature of the ERC's funding. The bottom-up nature of ERC funding is designed to channel funds into new and highly promising research areas. We can capitalize on the diversity of European research talent with a speed, agility and focus that is not always possible within some of the national funding systems or with top-down programs. Uh, top-down programs by necessity need sufficient lead-in time to prepare and plan. And the ERC approach can be complementary to more strategic or top-down approaches. When the ERC president and the vice presidents recently met with the chairs of the five mission boards in areas of cancer to climate neutral cities, we were able to identify hundreds of already ongoing ERC funded projects of potential relevance to these mission areas. We have also been working closely with the European Innovation Council and we recently released a joint statement between the European Innovation Council Advisory Board and the European Research Council and the Scientific Council. So the new um, European Innovation Council transition funding has been designed to help results uh, from the ERC proof of concepts to get closer to the market. We have already looked at identifying research trends emerging among ERC funded projects, and these can inform the development of revolutionary technologies that the EIC, so the Innovation Council, can fund. So joint thematic workshops on cell and gene therapy, as well as on energy storage, have been planned in 2021 to bring the world of research and innovation together, to exchange ideas, build networks, and expand the realm of the possible. Strategic or top-down research often unilaterally strives for economic growth or technical or technological solutions. But let me make one additional remark. Of course, there's no doubt that new technologies are important for the economy and the society. But as a social, scientist, social science and humanity researcher, I would also like to um, uh, make the following point. We are also in desperate need for new ideas about how citizens can give substance to sustainable living. We need more thoughtful views on governance and ethics. We need a richer knowledge base about what it means to be human and not get stuck in one dimensional paths for uh, technological innovation. And the fact that the ERC supports research in all its diversity can also allow us to offer a wider perspective. My third and final reason for optimism is that I hope and believe that the ERC can lead by example. We know that research funded by the ERC is expected to lead to advances and scientific breakthroughs. But it's also supposed to set a clear and inspirational target for frontier research across Europe. And this second part should not be forgotten. We know that we cannot fund every promising research, research, researcher in Europe. And indeed, the biggest disappointment that all the Scientific Council members feel is not being able to fund all the excellent ideas that the ERC receives every year. But maybe we can inspire every amb ambitious researcher in Europe by showcasing what the best science in Europe looks like 
that we can hopefully encourage others to raise their game too. And we are, of course, thankful also to the Association of ERC grantees in their efforts to showcase the many achievements of the ERC researchers. Are there then no problems or pressures facing the ERC? Yes, of course. The competition of ERC grants has been intense. As you've just seen in a previous presentation, the success rate in ERC competition averages only just above 11%. And ERC success rates are below those of other comparable funding organizations. And this in spite of the already significant steps taken by the ERC Scientific Council to manage the demand. As a council, we need to think about ways in which we can continue to address this. We also need to ensure that the ERC's peer review evaluation process can continue to identify scientific excellence irrespective of gender, age, nationality, or institution of the principal investigator and other potential biases. It is also critical that we can continue to pursue top scientists to take part in our evaluation panels. As one of the three vice presidents, one of my main, but not only, uh, roles is to supervise this recruitment. If I tell you that we need about a thousand panel members every year, that gives you some ideas of the size of this undertaking. So, in conclusion, I have great faith in the current Scientific Council and future members to be able to keep adapting our program as necessary to future cha challenges. As long as Europe has ambitious, creative researchers, the ERC will always be able to remain at the cutting edge. The ERC can continue to grow as the foundation of a flourishing ecosystem of support of research and innovation. And finally, it is my hope that the example of the ERC leads to more ERC-style funding and to acknowledgements across Europe of the importance of funding frontier research. A healthy research system needs to allow some space for researchers to use their creativity and follow their passions. Some may consider this approach to be idealistic, but I consider this approach to be necessary in order for science to have its maximum impact for the benefit of society. We need to make this argument for as long as it takes to be heard. And with this, I would like to end my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Evelyn, for sharing that uh, message of optimism, uh, but also acknowledging some of the challenges that the ERC faces going forward uh, and ending on, a, on a, an inspiring note uh, on the role of frontier research. Uh, that, was, uh, that, was, that was great. Um, so we've already had several interesting questions coming in uh, via the chat, so please do keep those coming. But I will now turn to, to the first questions we've received. Um, David Garcia Alvarez asks uh, whether applicants can use ERC funding to address new lines of research that are not fully connected with previous uh, research lines. Perhaps Jean-Pierre, does this uh, fit the ERC's definition of uh, high, high risk, high gain? Well, certainly, I think uh, the, the one thing which I've, uh, I've been uh, witnessing and uh, confronted with is talking to researchers who come to me and say, I got an ERC grant, you know, I had proposed something similar to my national uh, funding agency and uh, they turned it down because it was too risky. So I think we definitely encourage people who really have uh, ambitious and uh, really uh, an unusual ideas to really uh, submit the proposal to ERC. Thank you. Uh, and Evelyn, you touched on interdisciplinarity uh, during your uh, introduction, um, but we have a question from Jens Jäger, who asks whether uh, how panels handle truly interdisciplinary proposals, ones that include aspects that are represented in several panels. Could you maybe say a little bit more about how that works in practice? Yes, of course. Um, so many of the panels are already composed in an interdisciplinary way. Uh, so the panel members come from different fields, but still very innovative research may sometimes even cross over all these different panels and sometimes even across uh, the domains. Uh, so we make sure that in that evaluation process, also the experts of the other panels from the same or other domains are included in the evaluation process. And these are often very exciting advances of uh, new research. Thanks. Um, 
there's a question from MG. Uh, I'm not sure um, the full uh, um, uh, version of the initials, but uh, MG asks, uh, there has been continued emphasis on research that is not incremental. Uh, what would we consider as incremental research and aren't in some way all proposals uh, incremental? I don't know which of you would like to tackle that one. Well, that's a difficult question, but actually, uh, the very important point we we want to, we should make in in connection with the question is the fact that, uh, of course, uh, depending on your field, the the definition of a breakthrough uh, varies, because uh, it depends very much on 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 your field. So, in as a mathematician, for example, I know very well that some people come up with ideas which actually change completely the shape of uh, how people think about the domain because they introduce new concepts or new techniques. Uh, the same happened in other more experimental disciplines where all of a sudden a new uh, technology uh, opens uh, access to another scale of, uh, of uh, which was not uh, explorable before. Uh, and therefore, uh, of course, uh, this uh, makes uh, uh, then leads to possible breakthroughs. So, so I think uh, the definition is uh, has to be adapted. And the reason why the Scientific Council fully trusts uh, its panels, the ERC panels, is that we know that the people who know best what will be in a given discipline or in a given group of discipline, what uh, is going to make a difference, are the people from there. And uh, actually, one of the duties of the president or the vice president is to challenge the panel members as much as possible to tell them, please take some risks and uh, really don't uh, just uh, be sure, uh, just try to look at what is truly ambitious and what are the new ideas that you find really uh, that these ideas could change the, the way the whole discipline develops. Uh, thanks, Jean-Pierre. Um, Evelyn, if I could turn to you, you mentioned uh, the collaboration that the ERC has struck up already with the new European Innovation Council um, uh, under Horizon Europe. Uh, we have a question from Elena Dal Sotto, uh, who asks, what is the difference between an ERC proof of concept and an EIC accelerator grant? Uh, are you able to shed any light on the, the distinction between the, the two? Um, well, uh, I think I will ask Jean-Pierre to comment on the um, specific EIC uh, grants, but for the proof of concept, I can say that um, this is really a very successful uh, program at a smaller scale, uh, meant to kind of um, bring to the market products that came out of a running ERC uh, grant. So in that sense, um, it is really a proof of concept. Um, and the EIC takes it a step uh, further uh, and has really the ambition to work with these kind of proof of concept ideas or other ideas in the same line uh, to um, bring to the market um, yeah as that is their primary goal uh, Jean-Pierre would you like to add something to that yeah maybe I can add uh, something of course part of it has to do with the size of the support which can be provided of course EIC uh, means the, to bring people to develop uh, actually um, uh, companies or startups or activities which really immediately will lead to economic uh, development and and therefore the amount of money that the EIC will be able to provide is of a different order of magnitude. The other part has to do also that of course in our case what we get as proof of concept are really something which typically comes from the researcher themselves. In the case of uh, EIC, uh, there could be some investors uh, joining. And as you know, in the EIC, uh, some of the EIC programs, uh, there will be also the possibility of uh, really the European Commission coming up with uh, its own funds to develop uh, companies and, and even taking some shares of companies for some time. So, so I think the logic is a different one. Uh, the, the community behind it is a different one. But this does mean that they cannot be what has started, which is this kind of collaboration to identify what are the most promising things and then to make sure that on the side of EIC, uh, they really can uh, take advantage of these uh, really uh, new ideas and uh, new um, breakthroughs and uh, which could lead to really very successful companies. Thanks, Jean-Pierre. Um, I have a couple of questions related to synergy grants. Uh, Katerina Albala asks uh, whether she's understood correctly that there will be no 2021 synergy grant call. 
uh, and I think perhaps um, there you could give her some news about uh, uh, the upcoming 2022 work, work program. Uh, but there's another question uh, relating to synergy grants. Uh, Andre Tutunaru asks whether it's possible for the same PI to apply uh, both for a synergy grant, um, but also uh, for a starting consolidator or advanced grant call. Is it possible to, uh, to try both uh, on, on both sides? Uh, well, uh, for sure you can try. Uh, at, if you are successful at both, you have to choose which one you take. So, so definitely applying is not the issue, but uh, being funded, uh, you have to make a choice. Um, so that's uh, that's the the way things things go from that point of view. Concerning the um, non the absence of a synergy grants in 2021, actually it was a very practical issue. We we knew at the level of scientific council that there would be a delay in approving uh, the, I mean, the Horizon Europe program. And uh, we know that this, one of the consequences of this is a big squeeze in, uh, in the, uh, the time uh, uh, for which, during which we, we need to do evaluations. And therefore, it was, there was no room really to, to do a, um, a synergy grant program uh, in 2021, knowing that we would start more or less uh, almost a year after our usual date for, for starting. So this is why we didn't take it. But actually, the consequence is almost uh, minor, because even if we had started a synergy grant, it would have been launched in the spring of 2021, uh, when actually the synergy grant 2022 will be launched almost surely on the 15th of July, 2021. So it would have been just a two, three or four months difference. And, and therefore, I think uh, that was the reason why the Century Council decided that we will pass the uh, 2021 as a year uh, with the synergy grants. But we made sure that in the first call we are going to make for the, um, the work program 2022 will be the synergy grants. Thanks, Jean-Pierre. Um... We're almost running out of time, but we could perhaps take one or possibly two more questions. Uh, I think there's an important one from uh, Marta Agostinho, uh, who asks um, uh, how far the success rates of uh, ERC grantees or applicants for ERC grantee, uh, grants, I assume, are influenced by the resources and funding conditions in the countries or regions where they are based. In other words, what could policymakers and funders be doing to ensure that frontier research uh, through the ERC is nurtured for their communities in uh, different parts of Europe? I think that raises some quite important issues. Um, I don't know whether one of you would like to just briefly address that. Shall I make a start and then Jean-Pierre can follow up? Um, so um, indeed, uh, the, the, sometimes the mistake is being made uh, that at the national level, people think that um, the ERC can kind of um, be a substitute for national, or it can be um, uh, instead of the national funding. Uh, but that is really a mistake because uh, it is really important to have the basic funding uh, in place um, before um, being able to um, yeah, allow your researchers uh, to compete uh, at the level of the ERC. So I would really like to make the argument, if any policymakers are listening, that um, please don't forget about the basic uh, funding uh, in your home uh, country, um, because um, it is a very, very important uh, part uh, for researchers to grow uh, their ideas uh, and then to take it to the next level of an uh, ERC application. Would you like to um, comment on that as well, Jean-Pierre? Yeah, I can make two comments. First of all, the host institution is not an element of evaluation in ERC. That's very, very important. We look at the project and we look at whether the person who proposed the project is definitely uh, credible uh, with the project. The second point I want to make is a different one, since it has already been said that we don't have enough money to fund all the excellent projects we, we receive. Uh, one of our uh, duties as members of the council, but in particular for the president, is to convince as many ministers as possible that they should really uh, support the people who got what we call the unfunded A's, the people who got excellent grade at ERC. We could not fund because we didn't have enough money and they should be uh, funded at national level for the reason that there is no more uh, work to be done. The people have written a perfect proposal. It has been evaluated. The evaluation is available. And so without almost zero bureaucracy, you can immediately support excellent research. And I think this is one of our pleas uh, all the time we make to policymakers, just uh, do that. 
another advantage, of course, it makes the work of our uh, of our grant of our evaluators <laughs> of more value because actually they have already done the work. So why should it be done again? So I think uh, this is uh, something we. Uh, that's one way of enlarging actually the influence of ERC by having national structures to take over. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I think that's a great note uh, to end uh, this workshop on. Uh, there were just a couple of other questions in the chat, but the organizers have asked us to finish on time uh, so that people can potentially attend other sessions as well. Um, perhaps I could just uh, briefly plug two other ERC activities taking place at the Research and Innovation Days today and tomorrow. Uh, starting just now uh, is another live session, um, which is looking at the role of uh, scientific breakthroughs in dealing with societal emergencies, including uh, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So there are some great examples of ERC grantees from different fields of science who are uh, contributing to tackling the challenges posed by the, the pandemic. And I think that also reinforces the point that Jean-Pierre has just made about the importance of frontier research. Um, but also uh, four of our uh, very nice scientific officers from the agency have made themselves available today and tomorrow uh, for bilateral meetings with any of you who might have uh, more detailed questions about our grant schemes, about the evaluation process, about how to apply. And you can make an appointment with them via the ERC house in the Horizon Village that you'll find on the Research and Innovation Days website. So I would encourage you to, to make the best use of those possibilities. Uh, so now uh, let me just thank our two speakers this afternoon, uh, Professor Bourguignon and Professor Krohn, uh, Jean-Pierre and Evelyn, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us, and I think almost everybody has stayed till the end of the session, so it's good uh, to see that you found it interesting, uh, and please uh, check out uh, information about the European Research Council on our website and our various communication channels. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.